As she just mentioned, I'm Sarah Hamilton Buxton, and I will be the first presenter today. And I just want to thank you all for your time and attention. I think all three of us would be very much in agreement in saying that talking about grasslands and rangelands is one of our favorite topics, and we're really passionate about it. So thanks for giving your time. We will be discussing Great Plains grasslands and rangeland management for pollinators and plant diversity. So the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation is a nonprofit organization that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. You might wonder where the name Xerxes comes from. A lot of people find it hard to pronounce, much less spell, but it, we are named for the little critter pictured here on the right, the Xerxes blue butterfly. It is the first known U.S. butterfly to go extinct due to human activities. We're a relatively small organization, about 70, 75 employees now, but we do try to cover a number of avenues to um, approach and address invertebrate conservation. So we have a group of folks who focus on pollinators, um, also a program, a whole group of people dedicated to agricultural biodiversity that would encompass uh, mine and Ray and Ray's positions where we are partner biologists with NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they're a federal agency who works with agricultural producers across the country. We have a group of folks um, that work on endangered species conservation, even more who work specifically on aquatic inverts, uh, folks who focus on pesticide issues, as well as urban conservation. Here's a map of where our staff is located. We were founded back in 1971 and our headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. So as you can see, we have a lot of staff on the West Coast, but that's certainly not the only place we're located. We are across the U.S. and cover all of the U.S. So if you like and see, like and hear, like what you see and hear today, please consider becoming a donor. We are a donor-supported nonprofit organization, which means we simply cannot do what we do without our wonderful donors and our wonderful members helping us out. So please consider becoming a member. To give you a sense of what all will be discussed today, especially with three presenters, we just kind of wanted to outline for you. Uh, again, I'm Sarah and I will be covering ecological and social value of rangelands, as well as the loss of rangelands and pollinators in the Great Plains. I'll hand it over to Ray Moran, who will cover threats to remaining rangelands, as well as best management practices for Great Plains rangelands. And then Ray Powers will wrap it up with the rangeland plant nutrition and critical actions to protect and maintain our rangelands. So here is a map of the rangeland acres in the US back in 2007. So this is 15 years old, but I like this map because it's a great depiction of owner, land ownership, rangeland acres, land ownership. Um, so the US has in 2007, over 700 million acres of rangeland. And rangeland is a very broad umbrella term that encompasses many different ecosystems. So rangeland also er, encompasses ecosystems like grasslands, scrublands, shrublands. It's a very broad term. Without our rangelands, many of our pollinator species would disappear. And I put this in bold because I think it's so easy for all of us to think of pollinator habitat as habitat that we plant or create or convert cropland to pollinator habitat or our yards to pollinator habitat. That's all wonderful um, and great pollinator habitat as well. But our rangelands, which as you can see, encompass so many acres of the US are really vital, critical pollinator habitat. We have a lot of pollinators that absolutely depend on rangelands. That's the only place that they occur. So the Dakota skipper is a butterfly that comes to mind in the Northern Great Plains that has to have rangeland to survive. Regal fritillary is another species that is rangeland obligate. They, they must be on rangelands. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the, this map is great to depict ownership. So the dark brown areas indicate privately owned rangeland. The tan or light brown areas indicate publicly owned rangeland. And as you can see here in the Great Plains, most of our rangeland acres are privately owned. Whereas out west, there's certainly some places where there's a lot of privately owned land, but by and large, it's publicly owned rangelands out west. And that's important, um, especially from a management implication. So privately owned rangelands are managed or can be managed quite differently than our publicly owned rangelands. 
In the Great Plains, privately owned rangelands are often owned by family owned ranching operations where they have that family has a really vested interest in keeping that uh, those rangelands, their ranching operation viable, both economically sustainable and profitable, but also ecologically sustainable so that they can pass their, their operation on to the next generation. There's also a lot of cultural and societal pride that goes into um, owning and operating a, a viable ranching operation in the Great Plains. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Also, the number of managers to acres ratio is quite different in privately owned rangelands versus publicly owned, meaning that a rancher in the northern Great Plains, and I would just ballpark an average number of acres that a ranching family is operating is anywhere from like 1,000 to 5,000 acres. So that's a pretty good ratio compared to out west when you get into publicly owned rangelands where we have federal agencies managing tens of thousands of acres with a limited boots on the ground staff. So there's just some real differences to keep in mind when you're talking about publicly owned rangelands versus privately owned. So specifically, how are the Great Plains rangelands different from Western rangelands? And there's so many differences that we did want to dedicate just a few minutes to describe them. So number one, like I mentioned, rangelands is a very large, broad term. But when we talk about rangelands specifically in the Great Plains, as indicated in this green area here, we're really talking about grasslands. So landscapes dominated by grass. In the Great Plains, we receive more precipitation than the arid rangelands of the West. Uh, we also has, have less topographic diversity. We don't have the mountains that we have in the West. Uh, and then also we had two really important disturbance regimes historically here in the Great Plains. We have very large herds of bison for millennia that would graze up and down throughout the Great Plains. Uh, and then also we had indigenous people who were historically burning these rangeland acres for a number of reasons, a few being to drive bison towards hunting parties, to send smoke into the faces of advancing armies, and to increase an abundance of edible plants. Today, that prescribed fire culture um, is persisting or is embraced in the central and southern Great Plains. I'm located in North Dakota and here in the Northern Great Plains, we don't uh, reach for prescribed fire as one of our primary management tools on rangeland. We have a few other tools that we use more of, but certainly prescribed fire is a great rangeland management tool that is used a lot in the Central and Southern Plains. Also here in the Great Plains, we have more native plant species on our rangelands than they do in Western rangelands. And just to reemphasize the importance our Great Plains rangelands are mostly privately owned, whereas our Western rangelands, like I mentioned, are more publicly owned. So from here on out, we're gonna zero in and specifically talk about Great Plains rangelands or grasslands. And I will probably use that term interchangeably. Um, our Great Plains grasslands are a really beautiful, I think iconic landscape. And when you're standing out on gorgeous grassland like this, it's um, very easy to be quite filled with awe at just how big they are and how beautiful they are. Uh, however, our prairies or our grasslands are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. And one of the reasons for that is that they're easily converted to other land uses. You don't need to go out and clear a bunch of forest in order to convert them to a different land use. And also they have really rich, deep soils that are great for farming. So it's easy to convert our grasslands in the Great Plains to cropland. And that is one of the primary threats to our Great Plains grasslands. But in the Great Plains, we still have a lot of intact grasslands. And the reason for that is again, these private ranching operations, privately owned ranching operations that are keeping the grasslands intact, keeping that grass green side up is what we'll say sometimes. Um, and they're doing so by profitably operating grazing operations on those acres. And again, those ranching families are really important to the um, social values of rural, the rural areas of the Great Plains. It's important economically to the rural areas of the Great Plains. So ranching is definitely a way of life in the Great Plains that people derive a lot of pride from, and they should. Also in the Great Plains, as I mentioned, very importantly, historically, we had uh, large ungulates, bison, 
grazing these areas as well as fire on these acres. That's key. That disturbance regime or that active management is key to keeping our grasslands healthy in the Great Plains. If we don't actively manage, if we idle those acres, meaning we walk away and we don't touch them, we just let them sit for decades. Um, we see plant uh, communities shift. You'll start to get woody species encroaching into those areas like Eastern Red Cedar or Juniper. Uh, here in the Northern Great Plains, one thing we really see a lot of, especially when we idle our grasslands is invasive cool season grasses coming in. So specifically smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass. And that really makes our plant diversity plummet on those acres. So disturbance is really important to maintaining quality grasslands in the Great Plains. As I've mentioned, rangeland is vital pollinator habitat. When I think about pollinator habitat in North Dakota, the first and the best areas that I can think of for pollinators are indeed our rangelands. You might wonder why. Well, in one fell swoop, everything they need is provided right there on our rangelands. They have forage, meaning pollen and nectar resources throughout the growing season. So on our rangelands, we have native flowers or forbs that bloom in the early, mid and late part of the season. They also have shelter for overwintering in the forms of woody debris that occurs naturally on our rangelands. We're also uh, bunch grasses and other stem nesting resources for their nesting habitat that they need. There's a wide variety of native, plant, native grasses that provide host plants for our butterflies and moths. There also is a refuge from pesticides on our rangelands. Now that's not to say that our Great Plains grasslands don't receive some chemical inputs. They certainly can and do, but it's nothing, it, it's very little compared to other land uses like the chemical inputs that we see on cropland or in urban and suburban areas. And then lastly, our grasslands typically are expansive connected areas or acres of habitat. So when I sit down with a rancher to develop a grazing plan with them, they're generally running on average about 2000 acres here in North Dakota. And a lot of that grassland is connected habitat. So there's just an expansive amount of space for these creatures, which is vital. As I mentioned, they are susceptible to being converted. One of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. Since European settlement, approximately 42% of our Great Plains grasslands have been converted to cropland. So here with this map on the left, everything in green is intact grassland as of 2020 or 2020. Um, everything in brown was converted to cropland 2019 or before. And then everything that you see in red, like here in eastern North Dakota, eastern Nebraska, that was grassland that was converted to cropland in 2020. So one way to summarize that or to kind of give you a rate of the um, loss or conversion of crop, grassland to cropland is from 2014 to 2018, we saw a rate of conversion across the Great Plains that occurred at an average rate of four football fields a minute. So four football fields a minute of our grasslands were being converted to cropland. So it's a really extraordinarily fast rate. However, it's important to remember that 53% of our Great Plains grasslands remain intact. So for the rest of the presentation, we want to focus on that 53% of grasslands that are intact, what we can do to protect those remaining intact grasslands and keep them quality habitat. So like I said, millions of grassland acres are remaining and a lot of those acres are dominated by native grasses and forbs. That's not to say all of them are, there's certainly a lot of rangeland acres I've been on in the northern plains that are invaded by exotic grasses. But even in those settings, we still have some native forbs that will persist. And that's important, that's vital for our pollinator populations that need that native vegetation, native grasses and native forbs to survive. So you might wonder, well, what's the solution? I think it's a pretty simple and straightforward solution for conservationists here in the Great Plains. And that is to work hand in hand with ranchers. They truly are vital conservation partners. Again, because the majority of our grassland acres are privately owned by ranchers, it's really important that we work with them to keep those grassland acres intact and to keep those ranching operations profitable and successful, both again, ecologically and economically. 
If they're not able to make ends meet, what happens to those acres? Well, they're converted to a number of different uses. Cropland, like you see here where it's flat and farmable, that land has been converted to canola fields or they get developed um, in Western North Dakota where this picture was taken. Oil and gas development is one option for development or certainly there's other places where you could convert, you could sell your land and have it converted to urban or suburban areas. So again, ranchers are really critical conservation partners in the Great Plains. Luckily, because our Great Plains grasslands need disturbance so much, ranching and pollinator conservation and other wildlife conservation absolutely goes hand in hand. So there's a win-win situation for both ranchers and conservationists. Um, this document that is pictured here on the left is a document that a few of us here at Xerxes created specifically for agricultural producers here in the Great Plains to describe ways that ranching sustainably, again, ecologically and economically is absolutely compatible and necessary for pollinator conservation in the Great Plains as well. So a few of the management practices that are recommended on Great Plains rangelands are grazing, prescribed fire and grazing, which is often called patch burn grazing, haying, brush and weed control, and interseeding. And interseeding means going in and um, seeding in some native vegetation, native grasses and native flowers into rangeland acres. So certainly uh, this document also goes through and discusses the risk and benefits of each of these management practices. There certainly are some short-term losses in pollinators whenever you implement a disturbance like grazing or burning. Um, especially for pollinators in the egg and larval stage, they can't escape these disturbances. So, you know, when you turn cattle out onto rangeland, they might trample some pollinators. They might eat some pollinators that are, again, in the egg or larval stage on grasses. But it's really, really important that we keep a long-term view when we are managing our grasslands. If we become so afraid to implement any type of management that we just say, no, we're not going to do anything, that ecosystem is lost over time because those plant communities shift. So uh, Rachel will put the link to this document in the chat for those of you who are interested in following up on that topic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ray Morans who will go into more detail. Thank you, Sarah. Let me turn on my video. Okay. And I think I'm ready to write. Oh, there we go. Um, excellent. Okay, folks, uh, I'm from Northern Oklahoma. So most of the photos that you see here are from the areas where I work most, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. So, uh, Historically and prehistorically, millions of acres of our grassland and prairie looked like this. Vast expanses of grass and wildflowers, very few trees, um, and a heck of a lot of food for pollinators. Next slide, please. Here's another example. Large expand of grassland, plenty of flowers for bees, butterflies, flies, and beetles. Next slide. This grassland hosted many, many pollinator species, uh, some of which are quite famous, like the monarch on the left, the regal fritillary on the right, which Sarah mentioned, and then a, uh, many other species, but one I, I'm very interested in is the Southern Plains bumblebee. It seems to be on the decline. So these gorgeous prairies, these vast expanses loaded with wildflowers sustain many pollinators. Next slide. But now, especially in the Southern Plains and the Central Plains, a huge amount of our rangeland has changed into this, cedar forest. Next slide. Cedar forest has very little value to pollinators. This, this is a photo taken from inside a cedar forest. Look how shady it is. Um, um, <laughs> not very pleasant. Next slide, please. This is a close up to show you what's on the ground. Again, what you're looking at used to be prairie. Probably 100, 200 years ago, this was full of wildflowers and full of pollinators. But now it's just got cedar needles and 
very few things living in there except for cedar trees. This is a big problem. Next slide, please. How big a problem? Well, this map shows you how big of a problem. This map uh, is taken from an NRCS document produced by the uh, Great Plains Grassland Initiative, part of Working Lands for Wildlife. And if you uh, compare the 2000 map to the 2018 map, you'll see that in the map on the left, eastern, the eastern half of Texas and the eastern two thirds of Oklahoma already had massive problems with cedar and other juniper species way back in the year 2000 with uh, some woody plant encroachment north of Oklahoma. But look at the map on the right and you'll see that in 18 years, the cedars have spread. They've spread westward in Texas, westward in Oklahoma. They've filled in some of the areas of Texas and Oklahoma where they didn't used to be. And now we also have a big problem with cedars in Kansas, the eastern half of Kansas, eastern third of Nebraska. Uh, you can see right along the South Dakota Nebraska border and then the eastern parts of the Dakotas. We're talking about millions and millions of acres that have been converted from grassland into woodland and forest. And again, this is a major problem for pollinators. Next slide, please. Fortunately, uh, the federal agency that we assist through our work helps to fund control of cedars. They have a huge initiative going on right now to help remove the invasive woody plants like cedars and other junipers. So if you are a landowner in the Great Plains, please be sure to uh, go online and look for your local USDA NRCS office. They can provide technical and financial assistance. In this case, in the photo shown here, this is a ranch in Southern Oklahoma that had a massive cedars. These cedars were so tall uh, and so abundant, it would have been difficult to get them rid of them any other way, except to use bulldozers and knock them down. Next slide, please. On our rangeland, a, ra a small uh, parcel of rangeland that my wife and I own here in Oklahoma, we had a huge cedar problem as well. And this shows the cedar forest, part of the cedar forest on our land in, in 2018. Next slide. I'm happy to say that we got some funding from our, our county conservation service to help with mechanical control of cedars and I started out by getting chainsaws and thought I could get rid of my cedar problem and and uh, caught a few, cut a few down and realized that it was way too big of a job for just me. Next slide. So we rented folks with heavy machinery. The machine on the right is a clipper. It clips tall trees down uh, very quickly. The machine on the left is a forestry shredder, a, a tree shredder or forestry mulcher. You could see all the mulch down below it turns gigantic cedar trees into mulch really quickly. And that's the main way that we got rid of cedars on our rangeland. Next slide, please. And when we did get rid of the cedars, this is what, in, in some of the areas, this is what came up. Beautiful wildflowers that had loads of bees and butterflies on them. So we we're very pleased. Next slide. So I've mentioned mechanical control, but here in the Great Plains, overall prescribed fire is the most important tool for fighting the threat of woody plant encroachment. We're not gonna be able to fight those woody plants, uh, all of them with bulldozers. There's, there's, there's just too many of the trees. We need to use prescribed fire to, uh, to, to prevent the seedlings from growing up into, into tall trees. So it's extremely important. Each year, millions of acres are burned through prescribed burning, but we need this number to be in the tens of millions of acres to catch up. Next slide, please. And um, I'm glad to say once again that the USDA NRCS does help to fund prescribed burning. Next slide. So you probably guessed that prescribed fire can harm pollinators. Pollinators are little critters and fire can incinerate them uh, particularly the immobile life stages like the eggs, the larvae, and the pupae. Also, fire has, can have indirect effects. It can temporarily remove the flowers. If you do a fire in the growing season, 
and there are flowers up already, the fire will knock them back. Uh, also, it can re uh, eliminate um, nesting habitat temporarily for some, for some bees, it can also knock back host plants. But again, these, these indirect effects, these are, these are temporary. Next slide, please. Even though I know of the harm of fire to be the bees and butterflies I love, I conduct prescribed fire on our rangeland here in Oklahoma because I know it's for the long-term good. You see here, we're burning up a cedar tree. Um, we're, we're clearing up some of the litter on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. We're improving the habitat for pollinators by burning it. Next slide, please. Because the number one reason we're burning, yes, fire does help our grasslands stay grasslands by killing woody plants, but it also increases the amount of bare ground to help the wildflower seeds to germinate. It also increases the blooming of multiple wildflower species. Next slide. And this, I got to see this with my own eyes, the positive effects of fire through my dissertation work here at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, where we conducted prescribed burns, in this case in Missouri, and the fire greatly stimulated the blooming of the flowers on the left and the right. It had really, really positive effect. Both of the sites you see were burned about three months before the photos were taken. And you can see how uh, resilient the wildflowers are to fire. Next slide, please. And my research also showed that this butterfly, this rare butterfly that Sarah mentioned, which is endemic to, to grasslands, it did better because of fire. Its populations increased due to the fire, the positive effects of fire on the wildflowers. Next slide. So quickly, some BMPs for fire. If you do conduct prescribed burns, we ask you not to burn your entire property all at one time. Try to divide it, your property up into say thirds or fourths and burn a third of it each year. If you burn the entire thing at one time, you might wipe out uh, a population of butterflies on your property, a population of bees. Uh, secondly, if portions of the burn unit do not burn, don't go in and try to burn them up. Leave them be. They can provide little micro refugia for, for uh, rare pollinators. Rotate the season of burn, meaning don't burn the same time every year. Sometimes burn in spring, burn in summer, burn in fall. But most importantly, burn when you can. It can be difficult to find the right weather to burn, to find enough help to burn, but we need to get more fire on the landscape in the Great Plains. Next slide. So another thread I want to talk about a bit is chronic overutilization. And I want to highlight the term chronic. What we see here is some rangeland in eastern half of Texas. And you can see that there's almost nothing there growing above one inch in height. This actually is not a huge problem if it only occurs for a, a, few, a few weeks or a few months per year. The landscape can handle that. This is what the bison did for millennia. The bison would come to an area and graze really hard, graze it really short, but then they would leave and go somewhere else and graze that really hard and the area would have a time to recover. This pasture here, that's not happening. This is chronic overutilization because it looks like this every year. And that's a big problem for pollinators. Next slide, please. Same thing in this example. It's grazed down to about an inch or two, which would be fine for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a whole growing season, but not when it's like this year after year. The flowers don't have a chance to grow. Next slide, please. In this example from Texas, you see that the grazing was so severe that there is very little vegetation. There was no vegetation holding in the soil. And so down in the lower part of the screen, you see massive amount of erosion, soil erosion occurring due to chronic overutilization. Next slide. So the solution of this is prescribed grazing. We still need to have livestock out there, but we, we need to manage the livestock in a way 
that we still have enough grass out there and enough wildflowers for the pollinators. And the best way to do this is to provide long periods of rest, which will allow the wildflowers and the grasses time to recover. And prescribed grazing is definitely something that the USDA NRCS supports. It's one of their most important conservation practices. Next slide, please. Here's an example uh, of a grazed, of a grazed, of grazed rangeland. You don't see cattle in the photo, but I promise you, this is grazed by cattle each year, but rest is provided as well. Plenty of wildflowers for the pollinators. And there were lots of pollinators the day I took this photo. Next slide. Another example, grazed rangeland full of wildflowers. So many ranchers are grazing their land in a way that is perfectly compatible with pollinators. Next slide, please. And the benefits, uh, Sarah hinted at this before, grazing can promote native wildflower diversity. That's extremely important. Without cattle removing some of the vegetation, some of the grass in particular, the native wildflowers can get drowned out by a sea of grass, including uh, dead grass from last year. Next slide, please. Finally, I'm gonna cover one last threat quickly, and that is the lack of appreciation of forbs, forbs being wildflowers. Some ranchers view wildflowers as undesirable because they see them as competitors to grasses and because they believe they are toxic to their livestock. Well, forbs aren't really major competitors to grasses overall. And secondly, yes, some of them are toxic to livestock. Uh, the majority are not, a few species are, but even these species that are toxic, we find and many, many ranchers have told us firsthand that their livestock know well enough not to eat the toxic plants. They taste them, they can tell they're unpleasant and they leave them alone. All of us have been on many, many large ranches full of wildflowers, including toxic wildflowers that are also full of cattle the, the, and the cattle are doing just fine. So we're worried about the lack of appreciation Forbes. Next slide, please. Those ranchers who think Forbes are evil are spending lots of money to spray their entire ranches with herbicides from an airplane, unaware of the value that wildflowers have to livestock. So this picture, which I think is a beautiful landscape, I want you to look very carefully. Notice all the plants there are green. There are no, there are no bright colors there. It's all grass. There's virtually no wildflowers there at all because what you see here was sprayed with herbicide from an airplane. Next slide. Here's a close up to show you that, gee whiz, it's all grass. It's all grass, no flowers. Next slide. So what we're looking at here is probably 50, 100, 150 acres. Imagine how many pollinators this could feed if it had wildflowers. It could have thousands and thousands of bees and butterflies if it had flowers. But let me tell you that this is part of a ranch that's tens of thousands of acres in size. So if this rancher had never started spraying to kill wildflowers, his ranch would have many, many millions of butterflies, including some very rare ones, bees and butterflies. So, so this is a major issue. We need to get ranchers, and some ranchers totally get it, but for those ranchers who are spraying to kill all the wildflowers, we want to change their minds and make them appreciate the value that wildflowers have to their livestock, not just to pollinators, but to their livestock. And now it is turned for a time for my colleague, Ray Ann up in Nebraska. <laughs> Hey, and thanks, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction to the Great Plains Rangeland. And Ray Powers, or Ray Ann, to distinguish me from Ray Moran's in Oklahoma. I'm coming to you live from my home office in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and I'm a partner biologist with NRCS, previously stated. 
Um, I provide technical assistance. Hey, Ray. Support. Yes. So sorry, you're cutting out a little bit. I don't know if you can go a little bit closer to your microphone. Yep. Thank Is that you. any better? Yes, much I better. Try Thank to you so speak much. up. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for that, Rachel. <laughs> of course. Um, so I provide technical support um, and assistance across Nebraska and throughout the state of South Dakota as well. So Sarah and Ray and I sort of form the backbone of our, of our rangeland team here at Searcy's. And as we were working on that management document for pollinators that um, Sarah highlighted earlier, we really came across this knowledge gap in the literature, um, oftentimes in 12 flower field guides um, or other identification guides, you'll see some broad information about palatability um, of wildflowers for livestock. Um, it'll say things like, you know, this is decent forage, fair forage, poor forage. Um, usually there's not a reference to go to to find out, you know, sort of how that quality statement was made. Um, and there's little to no sort of value based nutritional information um, or mineral content of wildflowers, which is in strong contrast to what we know for both native and non-native grasses in this region. Um, they're both, both native and non-native grasses have been extensively researched for forage value um, and mineral content, you know, across the region in different places on different soil types throughout the season. Um, so it just seemed like a really stark difference when we know that there's lots of really abundant wildflowers out there on the landscape. And anecdotally, we know that livestock are eating those wildflowers. Next slide. Once we sort of acknowledge this knowledge gap, um, we decided let's, let's just do it. <laughs> um, so in partnership uh, with NRCS, especially in North Dakota, North Dakota NRCS has been a great enthusiast and um, very supportive of this project. Uh, we went out to find out what wildflowers are providing for our livestock in the Great Plains. Um, so what did that look like? Uh, our first step was kind of to target regional wildflowers. We wanted wildflowers that were common and abundant so we know they're making up you know at least some percentage of what a cattle could be eating. Um, we also wanted things that we were hearing from ranch managers or land managers that their cows were eating. Um, so we were kind of targeting things that were really abundant and hopefully tasty to cows. Um, and then we, along with a entire network of people <laughs> throughout the Great Plains went out and collected plant material um, out on prairies and rangeland throughout the region. Um, those plant materials were dried and sent to a lab to be analyzed uh, for both forage quality um, and a whole suite of minerals. So if you're not familiar with sort of ranch language and forage and livestock information, that forage quality is just um, a couple of different measures of what that plant material is providing to cattle to help them you know, maintain and gain weight um, and uh, be healthy through time. Um, minerals can be any of a, a whole suite of elements that are supporting um, growth and reproduction in cows. Um, and if you've worked at all in human health, you know that a lot of times those mineral levels uh, can interact with each other. It's a, it's a pretty complex data set that we're looking at. But um, those minerals are critically important for a number of livestock measures that our ranchers are interested in. Um, and the goal uh, in the next year or so is that we will incorporate um, those results into a wildflower guide, um, actually a couple of regional wildflower guides that can be shared with the stakeholders within the region. So um, those folks that Ray Morans work, works with in Oklahoma um, can see this literature about, you know, these wildflowers that you see on the roadsides but that have been sprayed out of your pasture um, are actually really great for your livestock. Next slide. So um, it's been a really fun project to work on. And all three of us um, and other Xerxes staff, some of whom are on this call, <laughs> um, went out and collected plant materials. Um, but we also did have a lot of help from 
and our CS employees, Plant Materials Center employees, other nonprofits, um, just a huge response to our call to help us with this project. Um, over the growing seasons of 2021 and 2022, we collected 730 samples across 10 states in the Great Plains region. We collected samples from 67 different wildflower species. Um, those initial results um, are really encouraging. And uh, the team right now is really just sitting down and digging in some Excel files to try to have more information to share with people, sort of sort out how to interpret this data and what is best to share. Um, but we were seeing really high levels of crude protein and total digestible nutrients. Um, and when I say high, I'm, I'm talking of uh, in comparison to grasses. Um, so grasses for crude protein um, can have anywhere from about 18 for their crude protein level early in the, early in the spring, late spring, um, and they drop really quickly. Um, we were seeing multiple, maybe even the majority of the wildflower species um, with higher crude protein levels. Uh, 20s and 30s for crude protein, um, and also really high total digestible nutrients. So these are definitely things that are great for your livestock. Um, we were also seeing really high levels compared to grasses of important minerals for cattle health, like, like copper. Um, and for the most part, the vast majority of the plants we looked at did not have toxic levels of these minerals. Um, so a lot of times ranchers will supplement some minerals um, and that can be really expensive. So I think um, disseminating this information that some um, wildflower species are high in copper. You don't, um, you can maybe rely on those to provide high levels of copper is really important. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, those wildflower guides and any new information on this project will be found on our Xerces Rangeland website. And I really want to give props to Sarah Hamilton Buxton, who took this project um, over the finish line um, to get this range uh, website, which is relatively new, um, finished and completed. So this is what it'll look like when you bring up the link. And I think uh, oh, Rachel already put it in the chat. And that management document that we linked to earlier can be found on this page. So once we get those regional guides um, up, they will be posted here um, and you can download them. Um, and this is also a great place to just kind of keep an eye on what Xerces is doing on the plants. Next slide, please. Okay, so Ray kind of went through management actions on rangelands to protect pollinators and to save our grasslands. Um, if you're not a rancher, you don't own, lease, or manage grasslands, I want you to know that your voice and your actions are really important for saving grasslands in the United States. Um, and there's a number of ways we can support grasslands here in our country, and I'll walk through kind of three broad categories um, of actions you can take to support grasslands as a non-owner or manager. So the first sort of category I'll go through is at the grocery store. How can we save our grasslands at the grocery store? Or at the food co-op. Um, and I want to preface this by saying that <laughs> food selection and diet is a really complex issue that has a lot of environmental impacts and the decisions we make um, are based on a wide variety of inputs, um, including culture, availability, budget, um, any number of things. So I just don't want to be prescriptive in these recommendations. I sort of want to outline choices that can have a positive impact. Um, for grasslands. So if you live in the region um, and you know of a producer who's doing really good conservation work on their ranch, um, buy their beef, buy their bison um, when that's available. That's a really concrete way to support that ranch family um, and help them continue that tradition of conservation on their land. We repeatedly find in research studies that ranchers trust other ranchers and so by supporting a ranch that's doing good conservation activities, you're probably having an outsized impact on conservation in the region because those conservation-minded ranchers 
tend to talk to their neighbors um, and tend to be part of grazing associations and tend to share the message that they're being successful. Um, so they can have a bigger impact um, than someone from outside of the community coming in and telling them how to graze or what to do. This can be a little bit harder if you live outside the region or you don't have those connections. Um, however, you can find some of these producers online more and more. Um, a good place to start is if you have like state-based food co-op or a sustainable ag um, group in your state to start to find some of these good producers. You can also consider purchasing beef or bison from a tribal entity. Uh, historically and currently, we have a variety of tribes that are living in the Great Plains and doing conservation work. And maintaining those linkages to the land and the cultural heritage is critically important. Um, so if you can find a tribal entity to purchase beef or bison from, I would encourage you to do that. The Audubon Society has um, a beef certification program, and I put the logo up on the slide there. Um, Bird-friendly bird land or bird-friendly beef, if that's available to you, uh, that's a program that really has sustainable grazing practices required for their participants. And it also includes monitoring of birds, plants, and other wildlife in these areas. So that's a really great option if it's available. You can also choose third-party certified grass-fed products where they are available. Um, this is going to be through a number of organizations. There's like an American Grass-Fed Association. Um, an organization called A Greener World has a grass-fed certification. Um, another one I found was True Beef. Um, so that's something you really need to look at what their requirements are. Um, but all three of those I listed are have more stringent requirements for how much time is spent on grassland than our USDA grass-fed um, label does. So that third-party certified grass-fed um, is often more grassland positive um, than the USDA option might be. But finally, if you are finding grass-fed and or bison in your grocery stores with the USDA label, that does mean that those cattle um, after weaning are raised on grass-based forage and have access to outdoor pasture. So that's another good option um, if available to you. Next slide. In policy, how can you support your grassland? I would encourage you to call your senators, <laughs> which can be, uh, it's not fun. <laughs> it can be a little bit intimidating, but um, there are several important um, conservation based legislation coming forward. Um, so the North American Grasslands Conservation Act, you can find more information um, at that link there at the actforgrasslands.org. Um, but this is basically um, some legislation provide more resources for voluntary incentive-based conservation of grasslands. I'm sort of building on a lot of the work that we do at the USDA and the NRCS, but providing um, a dedicated fund to grasslands. It also includes some overarching planning for grassland conservation in the United States, which we don't currently have. Um, I believe that was introduced to the Senate this summer and is currently in committee. Um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act is a really monumental piece of legislation that I highly encourage you to call about in the short term. Um, this is legislation that will provide a vast amount of funding for states um, to do conservation with their state wildlife action plan. Um, and this has a decent chance of having some movement um, just still throughout the end of the year. It would probably be tagged onto the omnibus of federal spending. Um, so making that call in the short term is really important. Um, next year, we're looking at a new farm bill, which is its own creature <laughs> and has a lot of implications for, for food policy in our country, um, but also conservation. So as that moves forward, just um, pushing for robust, robust spending for wildlife um, and expanding policies that um, disincentivize breaking up native sod. Um, 
Also, when and if you see threats to the Endangered Species Act, um, I urge you to put a call in and, and really push to maintain that as a strong law to protect our endangered species. Next slide. So a lot of NGOs do some policy work as well. So supporting NGOs and also governmental organizations in your community. Um, they're also doing a lot of active land management, um, really run the gamut of activities for providing conservation on grasslands. So I would urge you to look into becoming a member of something like the Xerces Society. <laughs> um, in this region, uh, Audubon is also doing a lot of good work, as well as the World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy. Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever is another organization that partners with a lot of um, prairie conservation groups. Um, also, wherever you are, there's really wonderful local and regional groups um, to help conserve and support prairies. So I urge you to look outside and find what you can to best support what's in your area. Additionally, uh, local universities and extension departments do a lot. Um, they do a lot of outreach to producers um, and put out a lot of outreach materials. Um, whatever form you have of conser conservation districts in your state, um, I encourage you to get involved with the conservation districts. Um, they can have a lot of impacts on the type of management that happens on a local level. Next slide. Um, and sort of everywhere else in your life. <laughs> um, contributing to communities in the Great Plains region is really helpful for these grasslands and to help maintain these ranching families. Um, and we would love for you to come visit if you're not from here. And if you are from here, um, go outside and explore those places. Um, ecotourism has been a really viable way for some ranching families um, in my state to continue ranching. Um, so go and visit a working ranch um, and see some blow out penstemon plants or a uh, prairie chicken left. Uh, please come to the Platte River in March and see the Sandhill crane migration. Uh, we would love to have you. Additionally, um, hunting and fishing provide a lot of dollars for conservation. Um, and those leases on ranch land for hunting can be another um, means of supporting a ranch family. Uh, finally, spread the love. This is a really underappreciated part of the country. You know, I think the coasts really see us as flyover country. Um, so just expressing how much these grasslands mean to you and what we hold um, and what really just uncountable value they have for wildlife and humans um, is really important. Next slide. Um, so this is sort of a concluding slide. This was a, a quote from a producer um, in a paper, it's actually out of Saskatchewan, um, but I really liked it because it's not prairie by definition that provides species, it's how the prairie is managed that provides the habitat. It's not who owns it or who protects it, it's who manages it in the best manner that provides habitat for the individual species. Um, and I have a weird juxtaposition here of my son <laughs> looking at a mantis in the background. But I just really wanted to call out the importance of land managers for maintaining these really valuable landscapes for the future generation. Um, I want my son to be able to see a Southern Plains bumblebee, and I want his kids to be able to visit these grasslands and have them in a healthy state. Next slide, please. So um, we have a variety of resources at Xerces that are available for download. Um, like I said, from the Rangeland website, but covering a whole suite of guidance. Next slide, please. Um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel as well as all of our webinars and talks are posted on the YouTube channel. So feel free to visit and explore there. Next slide. And you can connect with us some um, on a variety of social media platforms. Next slide. And I think from Sarah and Ray's and mine, you can see that we don't do this in isolation. Um, thank you so much to all of the Xerces Society supporters, um, especially our members who really fund this important work. Next slide. Here are our contact information, our email addresses. Um, you 
These can also be found on our staff contact page on the website. If you don't get them jotted down now, we're always happy to hear from you. So feel free to reach out. Uh, we love to talk about grassing. Uh, that didn't come across in this webinar. I'll say it directly. <laughs> um, and I think with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and start answering some questions. Thank you so much to all of you. We do have um, some really good questions coming in. So I'm just gonna kick us off here. The first question is for Ray Morans. Um, is the cedar being planted for industrial harvesting or is it a native species coming back naturally? For the most part, it is a native species that is coming back naturally. Now there are still some folks who plant it. I think there might even be a couple of state agencies that sell it. Um, and hopefully those state, state agencies will stop doing that. Um, this is not something we should be planting. It's something we should be uh, eradicating. Where were the cedars? If they were native, where were they? Um, 200, 300 years ago, uh, before Europeans, European Americans came to, to, to dominate the Great Plains, there were Eastern red cedars and other junipers, but they were primarily, primarily restricted to areas that did not experience fire. Uh, these junipers are highly susceptible to fire. So if they were out in the open prairie, when there was a prairie fire, and prairie fires were extremely common for most of the last 15,000 years, the fires would kill the cedars. So cedars were restricted to the, the deep ravines or maybe rocky mountain tops. Yeah, we do have mountains in Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas as well. And, and we had cedars on some of those rocky outcrops and there was no fine fuel that, there to carry the fire into the cedars. So cedars are native, but they are invading the grasslands now that we have greatly, for the last 150 years, have greatly reduced the amount of fire on the landscape. Thank you so much, Ray. And I did want folks to know we are at the hour, but we're gonna go a little over time um, to answer questions. So if you can hang in there with us, great. If you can't, this will be recorded and provided on our YouTube channel if you wanna watch the question and answer session later. All right, next question, Ray Powers. Do you know if endangered or threatened bird species are moving into the cedar groves? The US bird population has been declining rapidly. Can we protect both pollinators and birds by protecting some cedar forests if the cedar forests are home to endangered or threatened birds? So um, as Ray commented, the Eastern red cedar is a native plant to this part of the world. Um, the invasion is really due to a number of issues um, and it's growing where it shouldn't be growing. Um, and probably some of our birds that are most at risk are our grassland birds. Um, I also doubt that these really uh, monoculture cedar stands are good habitat for many birds, um, simply because most of them really require invertebrates, um, especially in different stages of life for survival and reproduction. And you really are losing that with these, with these unique cedar invasion groves. So um, maintaining grasslands as grasslands is really important for many of our bird species. Um, and even small percentages of uh, forest cover or even a single tree can really impact our grassland birds um, because it leads to really high predation rates by some of our raptors who then move into that community and are able to perch um, on that tree. And so we do see even, even small changes in our grasslands can have outsized impacts on our grassland birds. And Ray, you wanted to add something? Yes, please. I uh, just want to uh, acknowledge to those of you who are in Texas that we are aware that there's an endangered bird in Texas, the golden cheek warbler, which needs junipers. It needs cedars. That's what it nests in, um, uh, primarily in the uh, Edwards Plateau of Texas. So I'm not, we're not saying get rid of every cedar. Uh, we, we certainly acknowledge that there are places where cedars belong and where they are important to certain biota, but by and large on, on vast areas of, of the whole Great Plains, especially the Southern and Central Great Plains, um, see, there are a lot more cedars now than there were 100 or 200 years ago. And they are, as Ray pointed out, causing major problems for some of our grassland birds and our grassland pollinators. Thank you, 
Thank you, Ray and Ray. Um, Ray Moranz's question uh, was for you. Can buffalo tolerate Forbes toxic issues better than cattle? So I don't think we know the answer to that, but I, I hope my coworkers chime in. I don't know that, I don't think that anybody knows the answer to that. Um, the three of us are getting, are starting to look into the toxic plant literature. And it turns out there haven't been that many studies that look at toxic, actual toxicity of plants to each different livestock species. There have been some, but not a lot. But what we can say is in general, the, the general body of research says that bison are less likely to eat wildflowers than cattle are. Uh, more likely, they're a little more focused than cattle. Now there are, there's a paper from Kansas by Town and Owensby, I think, that says the, that, that, that disagrees with that. But by and large, bison are less likely to eat wildflowers. Therefore, if they're, they're less likely to eat toxic wildflowers. But we, I, I don't think it's known whether they're more susceptible to the chemicals if, if given the same amount as cattle. Do either of you two, um, my two colleagues, know? I've not seen any literature um, explicitly looking at that either. So I don't know. Thanks. I agree. I think it's unknown at this time. Thank you. All right, Ray Powers, once herbicide has been ceased, what is the remediation process, if any, to restart wildflower populations? Yeah, so this is um, within our management guidelines. We do have a section on interseeding, um, but for time today, we sort of didn't go into that. Um, but adding native wildflower seed um, to rangelands to increase their plant diversity is, would definitely be one step. Um, I think we would all first recommend that you wait. <laughs> um, some of those seed banks uh, can, can last a really long time. And so if you see herbicide use, you might be surprised um, at what remnant communities come back um, and also what's being brought seed wise um, onto the landscape. Um, and then I think we would also advise for really looking at nearby remnant prairies so that you're, you're adding back prairie species that are um, locally made. Okay, thank you. So none of you tagged to this question, but I think it's an important one. So I'm gonna ask and throw it out to the group, whoever wants to answer it. Um, Jessica's wondering how do ranchers in highly rural areas overcome their neighbor's fear of wildfires? Recent droughts in Northwest Kansas have made it nearly impossible to conduct prescribed fires. And there's a strong social pressure to not burn regardless of circumstances. You go first, Ray Morans. <laughs> I just volunteered because this is a very, it's a very tough question. It's, yeah. it's not, not easy uh, to convince folks to burn. Um, you know, Sarah know, so knows that because um, the great majority of ranchers she's, she works with do not burn and probably would get a little upset if, if she suggested they burn. Uh, I may be wrong there, but um hopefully uh, show folks the research showing uh, how well plants do, including the grass and wildflowers that, that their livestock eat. Um, fire greatly stimulates um, production of fresh, nutritious biomass, whether it is grass or wildflowers, and that is forage for livestock. Um, so, um, I don't have the magic formula, but presenting the research to folks, we probably need more research from Northwestern Kansas uh, on the effects of fire. I think there's very, very little. I think the great majority of fire research has been done in the tall grass prairie and maybe mixed grass, uh, Eastern mixed grass rather than the, the uh, Western Kansas, the mixed grass and short grass out there. But we, we need to show folks the facts that uh, that the landscape does recover and the, the plants are nutritious for livestock after a fire. I think too, um, some of that work is on us <laughs> and on um, prescribed burn associations and conservation professionals to keep spreading these messages and making it more 
okay to burn. Um, but I also think a critical component of that is having an early adopter. Um, in the north central part of Nebraska, there really wasn't a lot of burning happening on our eastern Sandhills area. Um, but once you kind of get the crack in and you get one rancher to burn, the adoption in the area really grows um, because your neighbor sees that new green grass growing. They see the healthy cattle on your side of the fence. Um, and so I think it's really up to everybody. <laughs> um, and sometimes just taking that first step can be really scary and you might get a lot of blowback for it. Um, but in the long term, you're probably making a really big difference. I would also like to chime in and say, um, you know, if I put myself in a neighbor's shoe and I hear my, my neighbor is burning and I'm quite nervous or it's very dry, I would want to hear from my neighbor who wants to burn some mitigation techniques they have in place, like creating fire breaks. They're only going to burn on days where the wind is under a certain speed. Who are they going to have administering that prescribed burn? Is it people who have done this before, you know, people who are trained, highly trained in this? Um, and then also to Ray Ann's point, I think um, if, if there's some state, like maybe some state university land comes to mind for North Dakota or some publicly owned lands where there isn't a private ranching family who has their bottom line on the line for a prescribed burn, but there's some public lands or some state owned lands that can be that demonstration farm or that demonstration land that Ray Ann was just mentioning as kind of a first step. I think that's great. Um, that could be a great place for the community to start then they can come out and see the effects of that burn, see how that burn was conducted safely. Um, but it's not a private ranching family who's who's put a lot on the line potentially um, to do that technique. So I think that's some other great ways to maybe go about it. But it is a tough situation like Ray Moran's mentioned and I sympathize with you and I, I yeah, that's a tough one. Thank you all so much for answering that. All right, May Ray Morans, another question for you. How might bison herds use of rangelands different from modern cattle, assuming cattle are not overgrazing? Are they somewhat similar? They can be similar. Bison, if, if you take 10,000 pounds of live bison, you know, a bunch of cow-calf pairs of bison and a bunch of uh, cow calf cares of cow calf pairs of cattle and put each one in a one acre enclosure they're probably going to graze pretty similarly but when, if you have them on a big landscape uh, bison are uh, less dependent on water so they're gonna roam far and wide cattle can roam quite a bit but they need to stay close to water sources uh, and again it seems like the uh, it seems like predominant research says that cattle are gonna eat more wildflowers, a little bit more wildflowers than bison are. Bison are more grass focused. Cattle are focused on grasses and wildflowers. Thank you. Uh, Ray Powers, Alex is wondering, they sell their beef direct to the consumer. They approached the Audubon Society about their label. They recommended that they ro do rotational graze and talked about using language of that described mob grazing, a no mention of fire. Have they changed the recommendations on grazing for birds? Um, I think that program has changed a little bit through time. Um, however, I would also note that sometimes the targets that they're looking for for birds is very short cover. And as Ray Moran's mentioned, having that what many ranchers would consider overutilization of a pasture from a plant diversity, wildlife and forage standpoint is okay, as long as it's given sufficient time, which I do believe is part of the Audubon standards. So a lot of the recommendations from NRCS, um, even to present day has been sort of pay calf, lead calf when it comes to forage. Um, which certainly is a sustainable way of maintaining grasses, but sometimes can lead to grass dominance as they outpeak wildflowers when you leave that much above ground materials. 
Um, and so having some overutilization of spaces actually opens up areas for wildflowers to thrive. Um, and so it's not necessarily a bad thing, provided it's not done. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, Raven is wondering if you're seeing any trends in non-native forb species dominating after burning in the flames. So all, well, not all of us, um, but we're mostly central Great Plains and Eastern Great Plains based, although we do work in the Western Great Plains. Um, so one species that comes to mind for me right away is cheatgrass. Um, it's an invasive pool grass that um, typically does really well after fire. Um, so I think all of these recommendations have to be site specific. So if you're in a place with an active cheatgrass and cheat grass and grass invasion, um, fire might not be in your toolkit this year um, until you've used other methods to sort of limit that um, in influx of an unnatural species. Um, I don't know, do you guys have anything, other, any other species come to mind? Sorry, in the first part, I should have read the whole question. In the first part of the question, they're in the fescue belt. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, they've seen a lot of non-native clover and plantain species out compete wildflowers in disturbed pastures. In, in my neck of the woods, the Southern Plains, and uh, unfortunately heading northward is a plant called Cerisia lespedisba, lespediza, Latin name Lespediza cuneata. And that one um, does really well with fire um, and might be expanding, might, might uh, be expanding a little bit with fire. So that is one where the Nature Conservancy, for instance, in Oklahoma is using herbicide to kill that. Uh, they do a lot of burning, they have a lot of grazing, and the fire and grazing are not enough to prevent the spread of that uh, exotic plant from East Asia. So they are using herbicide uh, to help control. Hmm. I so wish we had more time to answer every question, folks. I've taken a few photos of questions and maybe we can get the email addresses from Rachel, because uh, but we don't have time to answer them all now. Sarah? Rachel, I just want to chime in really quickly. I'm having issues with the Q&A app here, but I did see a question about if we're associated with conservation districts. And yes, all three of us through our partnership position are associated with NRCS field offices and the conservation districts located in those field offices. So that is a part of our outreach. The follow-up question was then, what's your outreach strategy? Um, and because we have such a great partnership with NRCS, that's a huge outreach outlet for us as partner biologists. So I just wanted to mention that really quickly. 